we're going to talk about tonight is TCITMITWD. You know what that stands for? That spells? Can you pronounce that? Pies busy as I'll do That's close. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> no, this actually, this stands for this class is the most important thing we do. And actually, I do believe that this is class is very, very important. And of course, a chiropractor adjusts, yet this class, I feel, is more important than, than that. And the reason I feel it's so important is it's, the aim is to change perspective on something that uh, we have had a wrong perspective of in America for a very long time. In fact, most people go to chiropractors for the wrong reason. And we're going to talk about what's the actual correct reason to go to a chiropractor for. But what are some of the reasons people come to chiropractors? Any back ideas? Pain. Back, back pain, pain, back headaches. pain, headaches. Any others? Can't move. Can't move, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of different reasons. And these are some of them that we hear. And sure, even in some of the research, it has been supported that uh, chiropractic seems to have an effect on some of these things. And, you know, we get people coming in with neck pain, even uh, some people coming in with asthma, as I'll share, uh, energy, hip pain, ear infections. Uh, some research shows that uh, kids with, that get regular chiropractic care, uh, like my kids, get, have about half the incidence of earaches as kids that don't. Um, ADHD, uh, allergies, you see, find some people that get some relief from allergies. All these different things, even some preliminary research on seizures and epilepsy, because it has to do with the nervous system, obviously. But would you believe that chiropractic actually does not treat any of those things? Even back pain. We don't actually treat pain. And we'll explain that more at length. It sounds like a crazy thing for a chiropractor to say. But almost everybody came here for the same reason. And almost everybody starts for the same reason. And that is you had a problem with your health. It was either a pain or a disease, but it interfered with your ability to live your life to your fullest. Otherwise, why mess with it, right? And someone told you that I might be able to help. So what we're going to talk to you about are all things, believe it or not, are things that you already know. And I believe that most of what I have to talk about tonight, you start out life pretty much already knowing. It's common sense. Yet somehow or other, that common sense understanding gets diluted with time. And just like a child starts out life with a correct posture. You know, you look at a toddler bending over to pick something up. And they point their toes at the object, their knees, their body points at the object. They bend with their knees. They keep their back flat. And they do it all right. They start out knowing pretty much how to have correct posture. And likewise with some of the things we're talking about. It's fairly intuitive. Most of this stuff you already know. So number one, what's my problem? Can chiropractic be a, a help? Number three, what caused it to happen? Number four, the benefits for people that have no symptoms. No symptoms. Now, first thing I do want to cover is I never want to hear you say, I believe in chiropractic. See, chiropractic is not a religion. So it does not need your belief. If I drop a bowling ball on your foot, just drop a bowling ball, whether you believe it will hurt or not, do you think it will hurt? You bet, yes. So chiropractic is based on science, on physiology, and on a tremendous weight of research evidence that has been borne out year after year after year in the lives of thousands of patients. So we don't need to hear that you believe. What I want is you to understand some of the concepts. I want you to understand it so well, in fact, that you can teach other people about it. And I do have, that does bring up my first apology of the night, though. See, my dad was a pastor, so I heard a ton of analogies. So I'll probably use a few, of anal a few analogies tonight, but I think you'll get the hang of it. So we talk about belief is not a factor. Let's talk about a couple facts. Research says that most of us have the capacity to make it well into our early 90s and largely without chronic disease. 
Now, if I had you visualize right now, close your eyes and you visualize right now, going forward 20 years, maybe it's 30, maybe it's 40, depending on your age currently, do you visualize yourself making it to 90? Do you even visualize yourself making it to that point without a chronic disease like cancer, diabetes, heart disease? You know, most of us in America view that as a matter of routine, that we're going to come down with one of these chronic Western degenerative diseases just because of the statistics. You know, look, you look uh, at 2050, they're projecting that two in three people will develop diabetes, two in three. So out of three of us, two of us would develop diabetes. That's a bad statistic. And yet, we, most of us have the capacity to reach 90 without any of those. And we're finding more and more people are doing that. In 2010, over 131,000 Americans have reached their 100th birthday. How many of you know someone over uh, 80 years old? 90? Okay. So we actually have uh, several patients that are over 90. One that uh, hit 100 a while back. Um, and she, uh, she did very well. But I believe that we were all intended to be much like a candle burning strong until we're snuffed out at the end, quickly. And that's because I believe everybody that comes into our office is designed by a master designer to be a masterpiece. And slowly over time, and exposure to stress and Western degenerative illnesses and the toxicities of our environment and uh, improper posture and all these different things, we become a mess. So that makes you all halfway between a mess and a masterpiece, which would be a masterpiece. Your masterpieces. <laughs> and that is our official standard policy. Everybody coming in is a masterpiece in our eyes. So what happened? Well, science would tell us that the weak link, whatever it is that uh, is your weak, weak link in particular, whether it's the heart or the cardiovascular system or your digestive system, something at some point that was already weak gave out and broke, and thus the whole chain of health collapsed. And that would be the standard model. However, I believe there's something much bigger than you, about you, than just a link of metal chains. You know, there's something different between, say, this piece of plastic and living human beings. If we go outside and I kick in a car door and I tell you, don't worry, number one, probably someone's going to be upset, but I tell you, don't worry, the car door will heal itself in a matter of four to six weeks without me paying for it, what would you say? Not He's crazy. Gonna no, not going to happen. <clears throat> Yet, if I fell and hit my rib on the corner of this coffee table and broke a rib, stoved up a rib, um, how, long, what, how long would it take for that rib to heal itself? Four to six weeks. You know, there's something different between inanimate matter and a living human being. And in spite of 10 years in school and 10 years in practice, I never cease to be amazed, almost like a child looking at the stars, I never cease to be amazed with how powerful the human body is. And it has that innate capacity to heal itself. You know, you can cut off a fourth of the liver and it will replace itself in a matter of weeks. You can, you can have a cut on your arm, and it does. you don't need to send that arm to... Uh, Mayo Clinic or to New York City to some medical school to, to have it heal itself. It does it on its own. And that's pre-programmed in your body with that innate intelligence that you have. So what coordinates all that, that healing mechanism, the healing mechanisms within your body, the immune system, the respiratory system, everything else? Well, it's actually the first system to develop. Guess what the first system to develop is? Any ideas? Your spine. Okay, spine, that's dead on. Some people, some people guess the heart. 
and it's very, very early. At the notochord, actually forms at 16 days. But you can actually see this little crease way back here. And just in a matter of uh, days, this primitive notochord forms as just a little crease, and it starts to have a micropolarization. If you know what, want to know what a polarization is, unscrew a light bulb and stick your finger in the light socket. That's electricity. So this is very small, and those little trophic nerve impulses that are very, very low background uh, nerve impulses are traveling through that spinal, what later becomes the spinal cord, as you mentioned. And then those nerves, bran nerves branch off and reach out to all the different parts of that little developing human being. And on the end of those nerves are little tiny buds. Much like fruit on the end of a tree bough, those little buds are what later becomes every one of your organs. And there that nervous system is from the very beginning, guiding, directing, controlling the development of this human being from the very beginning, almost like a loving parent. So the brain, of course, exists way up in the skull, and this is a mass of brain. This would be like a Goliath-sized brain, okay? But the brain lo looks a lot like that, kind of a grayish, gelatinous matter, and of course we spent a number of years in anatomy, and it's actually uh, mostly made of fat. So if someone calls you fat head, you can say, thank you, because it actually is true. The brain is mostly made of fat. And it's, it's sitting up there, uh, coordinating six times 10 to the 23rd power things at once. That's six with 23 zeros behind it. And I barely can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. The physician in your body, the doctor in your body, is way smarter than I would ever be. The smartest PhD, the smartest medical doctor, it doesn't matter. Your body is the smartest. And they say that the, just this year, in 2016, they, uh, I think Scientific America had an article saying that our brain contains 10 times more information than we previously estimated. Not only that, that's just the known parts of the brain. So this is a massive powerhouse, not just of electrical energy, it's sending electrical energy out, but of information. In that powerhouse, the brain exits the skull through this foramen magnum. So this little hole right here. And literally every message from the brain out to the body has to travel through that little junction. But it doesn't actually become the spinal cord until two or three segments down. Can you do me a favor and get my spinal model? So two or three segments down, that becomes the spinal cord. So that shows you just how important the top two or three segments are. And that's why our, offices, our office focuses more and more on that upper part of the neck, even though we do give attention to the whole spine, because that's kind of the light switch for your body. So look at this right here. If you have body balance with everything correctly aligned, the health and healing messages that arise in the brain travel down through that foramen magnum, through the uh, spinal cord, and out to the rest of the body, all 70 trillion cells. So when brain health and healing messages can flow to all the parts of the body, we can expect what? Good health. health, yes. Now on the other hand, when you have body and head and neck misalignment, and you have compression on the brain stem with, say, the, one of the top two bones, the atlas or the axis, that blocks off that health, those health and healing messages to your body. And then what do we expect to happen to health? It goes down. It goes down. Much like a coach on a football field. Who gets blamed if a football team, professional football team, starts losing? Who takes the blame? The coach, yes. And we're sometimes looking to all the players and not giving attention to your coach, the central processing unit of the body that controls, guides, and directs every other cell, organ, and tissue in your body. Telling your body even how to use nutrients that you're taking in. 
So this is a uh, study right here. It, they've done numerous studies since, but this goes, they've known this clear back to 1987, the Journal of Manipulative Physiological Therapeutics. And this is about what? What's that? Crib death. Yes, crib death, sudden infant death syndrome. And what they found is that parturational factors, which include maternal labor and delivery, and extrinsic factors like obstetrical procedures. What are obstetrical procedures? Well, they often use like tongs or different forceps. spoons or forceps. Um, or in some cases, they use uh, C-sections, which I don't know if any, probably nobody's ever seen a C-section, but they, they pull on the child's head as high as 90 to 120 pounds of force. That's that's enough force to actually lift a very small mother off the table a little bit. And then they pull the child out, and after all that force, they hand you the child and they say, careful, the neck is fragile, right? <laughs> so there's a problem there, that they've received attention. And these factors, any process, whether it's genetic, biochemical, biomechanical, or traumatic, that alters the normal development of the respiratory control centers, halt. Where are the respiratory control centers? The brain. brain, yes. Related to spinal constriction and compression. Wait a second. Does that sound like it has chiropractic implications? You bet. Following birth trauma may be contributory to what? Sudden infant death syndrome. Knowing that, and knowing that when chiropractors adjust children, we use no more pressure than what I would use pressing on my own eyeball right now. And knowing that, why doesn't every hospital make sure that chiropractors are present every time there's a birth? Any ideas? This is actually a, a big question. And it has to do with the first couple slides I showed you. Any ideas why they don't do that? One would be, what do people typically think chiropractors are for? Back problems. Yes, back problems. So why would they have a baby adjusted? You see the damage of that misconception? And it's primarily that damage is caused by the insurance influence on chiropractic over the past 50, 60 years. Chiropractic has become another animal slowly. And that's, that's a problem in our site. So that's some serious implications, and that's why I think every child should be uh, checked by a chiropractor. And I checked all three of my kids, of course, after their births. So the brain and the spinal cord go travel down, and they travel down through this protective, uh, protective sheath this, uh, made of bone. And if you know that something is protecting your nervous system, you're going to assume it's import, very important. Just like if you see an armored truck go by up the street wheeling, are you going to assume that the armored truck is carrying Doritos nacho chips? No, of course not. They could. Something, they could. <laughs> Some people might, might actually go after them. But it is very, is they're going to carry something very valuable. And likewise with the protection of your skull and the protection of your spinal column with the spinal cord. So what's this going down the, the center, the back, just like uh, a wire going down through a stack of donuts? What's that called? That's a spinal cord. Spinal cord, yes. And what are these called That's coming off? Nerves. Yes. I'm not for sure exactly what term. <laughs> That's it. Uh, vertebral nerves or vertebral nerves. And what are these called? Vertebrae. The white thing. Vertebrae. Yeah, vertebrae. And what are these called? Discs. Discs. You know the, the essential anatomy of, as far as within this simplified model, of what's going on. What's that? Okay. What's that, I'm sorry? The red. Yes, that's right. The, the, the red area was a damaged disc, which we don't want, and we'll talk about that. So this is my first analogy, okay? It is the safety pin model. And you, on one end, you have symbolizing the brain, and the other end, you have symbolizing the tissue cells. And the brain sends signals, this shows just the circuit that occurs of information going out through the nerves to the tissue cells, all 70 trillion cells. 
directly or indirectly. And then from the tissue cells back to the brain with feedback. It's a feedback loop. So that's constantly going, whether you're awake or asleep, whether you're moving or not. It doesn't just have to do with motor movement. Remember, there's that low gradient trophic nerve impulses that keep cells alive. And that's how the brain coordinates and directs every cell, organ, and tissue. And every of the 70 trillion cells, it guides and directs their cell life as well as the chemicals that they produce. So cells produce chemicals in your body which affect the chemical balance. So the brain coordinates and directs all that. Six times 10 to the 23rd power things at once. And that's basically the model. The problem is, this is a normal spine. The problem is, is when a bone is dislodged and subluxated and out of place, and what does it do to that nerve? It pinches it. So it blocks off flow of nerve impulse. So what is a subluxation? You can think of it as a nerve blockage. We know that we don't want an artery blockage, but we also don't want a nerve blockage. And that receives dreadfully low amount of, of attention. And that is a subluxation. So in our model, it would be like an unclassed safety pin. Now, are you going to feel this? Maybe. 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 Maybe that's not. that's an excellent answer. 90% of the time, you won't. Occasionally you will, but 90% of the time you won't because there's more to nerves than just looking pretty. They actually have a function and they control the organs and tissues. So if it's unclassed, the brain's not talking to the body, and what happens to those poor tissue cells on the end of that damaged nerve? Any ideas? Decay. Yes, they decay. And that's why chiropractors locate and correct vertebral subluxations. That's all we do. Locate and correct vertebral subluxations. So let's look at another analogy of a subluxation. A water hose. If you have a garden, how many of you garden? Okay. okay. Used to? <laughs> so if you have a garden and it's a drought and you have a water hose going to the garden, sending water to the garden, keeping it alive. And let's say you have two boys, right? Yes. Yes. Let's say both of your boys regress a few years and they're standing on the water hose for days on end. Not, what happens? They're not going to do that? They will. Okay. <laughs> they probably will. What, what happens to the, the plant cells in your garden? Oh, they're going to die. Yes. They ain't going to have no water. They're going to die. And let's say that you, as a water hose chiropractor, says, I need to locate and correct the water hose subluxation. So you remove the boys from the water hose and what happens to the garden? Does it spring instantly back to life? No. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a while for that to have sustained. Can you just take the uh, boys off the water hose once and expect it to magically come back to life and they're never going to stand on the water hose again? No, they'll go right back to it. I have two boys too. <laughs> so likewise with our bodies, if you take a heart cell, a heart cell, it's on the end of a cardiac nerve, and that your body is subluxating, pinching off that flow of nerve impulse to the heart, what happens to the heart? It starts to die. It starts to die. <clears throat> Maybe a slow process. It may not show up for years and years, but it's not going to work as well as it could have. And likewise with a subluxation. So a subluxation, that term, sub, means less. Lux comes from the Latin. Any ideas? Once in a while we'll have someone that knows this. A pastor or someone. Lux is light. An Asian is state of being. So they used to think that light traveled through nerves. We know now with research it's electricity. Or so we thought. Now we're beginning to understand that each cell emits what are called biophotons. But we understand mostly about electricity, so we'll focus on that. So let's look at an example of what happens. Contribution of renal innervation to hypertension in a rat. 
So the kidney has both, this by the way was 2008 uh, experimental biological medicine. The kidney has both afferent sensory and efferent sympathetic nerves. So remember that's in that pin, that's that cycle, that uh, feedback and, and innervation back and forth between the tissue cells in the brain. It can influence renal function. So it even affects your kidneys. Renal innervation has been shown to play a role in the pathogenesis of many forms of hypertension. So the nerves can even affect hypertension. What's hypertension? High blood pressure. So it can even affect high blood pressure. So let's skip on down here. Uh, they have found that it can even affect hypertension, renal enlargement, and cystic pathology. So things even other than high blood pressure. Actually, kidneys breaking down. Now, just as a, uh, as a little point, one of the things we do when we have a little extra time, and it received attention even in the news, is that uh, if someone comes in with high blood pressure, and we adjust them frequently, it may be different areas on different people, frequently it is the upper neck, because that's kind of a light switch, a, a uh, bottleneck, if you excuse the pun. But uh, what happens if I adjust someone that has high blood pressure and then just for fun, we check their blood pressure afterwards? What do you think happens? It goes down. It goes down. Now here's the key thing, whether or not you're, you uh, understand what we're getting at. What happens now in the case of someone with low blood pressure? Like for instance, my wife occasionally has low blood pressure. What happens when we do a follow-up blood pressure reading after adjustment with them? Any ideas? It rises. That's right. Because chiropractic does not treat high blood pressure or low blood pressure. Rather, it just releases those health and healing messages from the brain to the body so the body can regulate itself more optimally. Rather than me telling your body what it needs to do. See, everybody has a different level that is most optimal for the individual. Do we all need 120 over 80 blood pressure? Some people would faint at that low of blood pressure. Other people, that would be very, very high, and they'd have a headache. So averages don't tell us where you need to be, and that's why we rely on something that knows a whole lot more than we do, than guessing and medical practicing. It's, it's just practice, right? They practice until they try to get it right. So your body knows a whole lot more than the experts. So it's even shown in the research. Now here's a little uh, scenario that we'll go through. What if T6 is subluxated? T6 sends nerves right over to this organ. Can you see what that is? Right here? The stomach. Yeah, that's the stomach. So what if T6 is subluxated? At 10%, no symptoms. Doc, I feel great. Couldn't feel better. 20%, no symptoms. I feel great, couldn't feel better. So you get this theme here, is that it take, there's a process of time. Remember the latency with the garden? Mm -hmm. With deprivation of water, it'll show, it may, may take a little while, but eventually it's gonna show. 30%, okay, let's say you start to notice belching. Well, but that was from the food, the pizza I had last night, okay? So you let it go. 40%, bloating. Well, I had uh, too much milk on my cereal this morning. All right, so it gets worse. 50%, nausea and stomach ache. Now it has your attention, right? Nausea and stomach ache. Belching, bloating, gas, that's a deficiency of what? Of Pepto-Bismol, right? So we take Pepto-Bismol, hide the symptoms, and it gets worse. And pretty soon, 60%, you start to get heartburn, so you ignore, you mask the symptoms, and it gets worse under the surface. Just hiding your eyes doesn't make the, uh, the monster go away, right? So 60% heartburn, and that is a deficiency that has your attention. And we know that's a deficiency of what? Antacids. <laughs> so we take more antacids and cover it up more. 70% you actually start to show bleeding, black tarry stools. So that's the time to come into a chiropractic office and go straddle one of the tables, right? 
Wrong. We got to send you somewhere else. It's too late. Now, definitely still get those subluxations checked, but it, you got to have to have another expert working with you, a GI doctor. 80%, you're letting it go even further. Dizziness. 90% plus, you start to notice more and more cellular death. So the cellular death, of course, starts before then. We're always having cells die, but it's continuing at a fast rate. So you see, this is a continuum of time. And that's why we encourage people not to make sure that the freezer is plugged in with all the meat. Until, don't wait until you smell rotting meat. Check it before then. So how do we find subluxations? So a chiropractor can, number one, palpate for them. We can look for them. Okay, palpation. So palpation, and uh, of course, we spent quite a few years studying, and of course, chiropractors have more anatomy on the musculoskeletal system and the nervous system than a lot of uh, disciplines of even medicine. However, uh, with palpation, we're going to simplify it a little bit. Will one of you volunteer? <laughs> Come on. Come on now. We're going to train you. You'll be off the camera. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move a bone out of place. People think it's just so amazing that chiropractors can palpate a subluxation. Now, the understanding of anatomy, that does require a, quite a bit of, of schooling. But as far as palpation, it's, it's perhaps more amazing that you can tie a shoe or button a shirt in the dark. So I'm going to put a bone out of place. And what you're going to do is just run your fingers down both sides and tell me, yep, and tell me where you find out of place. You found a subluxation? Congratulations. You graduated from Fall <laughs> University. <laughs> a chiropractor. All right, so that's essentially we check for the alignment, we check for motion in the joints, and we check also for muscle tension. Any one of those three factors can indicate a subluxation or a bone out of place because your own internal chiropractor, the muscles of your body and your nervous system, are actually trying to keep you uh, correctly aligned. The problem is over years and years of stress and sitting, in modern life, uh, oftentimes it becomes a chronic subluxation. So we just in sitting is that worse than standing? Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Notice you're sitting, I'm standing. <laughs> See? <laughs> okay, so that's part of what we. That's right. That's part of what we're looking for. We can look for them through range of motion and posture. Posture is a window to the spine. We can tell a whole lot about. Uh, the spine just by, based on posture, kind of like growth rings on a tree. The past shows up in the spine. And a chiropractor can also use instruments like infrared thermal scanner or x-ray as necessary. Of course, we'll be adding the uh, infrared thermal scanner soon. X-ray we do less and less of. Because uh, why? What happens when you're exposed to radiation that accumulates in your body over time? Any ideas? Yeah, kills more stuff. Essentially, cancer can develop. So we like to keep your radiation exposure to a minimum. Why? Because that's how I treat my family. I will refer out for nest if necessary, but I keep my family exposed to as little radiation as possible. One CT scan, and some, uh, some authorities say one CT scan will increase your risk of lifetime, your lifetime risk of cancer by how much? Double. Double. So definitely anybody, whether dentist, chiropractor, medical doctor, make sure that they're not just doing a routine screening. Make sure that they uh, have a reason for exposing you to any radiation with any imaging. Um, so definitely important there. So to answer your first question, what is your health problem? If I invited you to this class, it means I found a subluxation or suspected that you may have one that you show a certain pattern of reoccurring subluxations that indicate a chronic nature of it. If a friend invited you to this class, they have suffered from the effects of subluxation and suspected that you may have one too. Although you may have other medical diagnoses, we do not treat pain or disease. Is there any switch on your body that I can shut pain off? I wish there was, but there's not. 
And I wish there was sometimes too, because I've been in severe pain, and I understand that. However, pain also keeps a person from doing what? More damage. So see, that's even an aspect of that innate intelligence in the body. Let's take inflammation. If you have inflammation, what is the body doing? Giving you a warning. Giving you a warning while it repairs. So it's sending more nutrients to the area and carrying away toxins from an, air, an affected area. So we do not treat pain or disease. It doesn't matter what diagnoses you may acquire what you may pick up, what you may have have in the past, we're not treating your diagnosis. All we're doing is reconnecting brain to body through a healthy spine, restoring that flow of health and healing messages that give you more metabolism to heal, that give you more energy to move, and thereby allowing your body to regulate itself like it's supposed to once again. So here's a question had a patient that, uh, among other things, we see a lot of different things, but there was a patient uh, that had gangrene in, in, uh, in an extremity. And what was I, when they call in and ask me, Doc, should I still come in and get adjusted? Here's a question for you. Am I going, ever going to tell them, no, you're gonna die. So let's just leave those subluxations in your body and let your body be robbed of all that electrical information coming from your brain. Would I ever tell anybody that? No, it doesn't matter what condition you have, you need that connection between brain and body for optimal function. So it doesn't matter what diagnosis you have, our goal is to locate and correct what? Begins with an S? Subluxation. Yes, subluxation. So when you came in, you told me about a sore back, neck pain, a uh, terrible headache, and you probably noticed I wasn't listening very much. Okay, I do care, and I do listen, but the reason it may feel like we don't always give uh, a lot of time to that is because chiropractic is not a way to treat those things, remember. Chiropractors don't treat pain. We treat subluxation or nerve interference. Chiropractic is a way to help your body become healthy. When your body is healthy, it innately knows how to heal those, those long-term uh, wounds or long-term health conditions. And we rely on that internal physician that knows a whole lot more than any doctor, chiropractor, PhD, or medical doctor. So don't give your chiropractor too much credit. It's your own body that is doing the healing. All chiropractors are doing is making sure that the conduit for information is open, free, and clear. So can we help you if we detect subluxations through palpation, loss of range of motion, or abnormal posture, or thermal scan? Yes. Chiropractors are the only ones trained to detect and correct vertebral subluxations. So what keeps causing a subluxation? The answer is what? Stress. Stress. Who does not have stress? Raise your hand. Okay, that's everybody. Everybody has stress. So there's three flavors. If you ask me what keeps causing a subluxation in you, I'm probably going to tell you chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Right? So mental, physical, and chemical. What's an example of mental stress? Traffic. Traffic. An election. Yeah. Holiday shopping. <laughs> physical stress. What happens when you have mental stress? The muscles tighten up up here and pull. The muscles pull on the atlas and the axis and shift that out of place and cause a what? Subluxation. Subluxation. Which pinches the what? Nerves. Nerves. So physical stress, bending and twisting. Pretty obvious there. Chemical stress. The average person, the list of medications we see people with is phenomenal today. And we all know that many medications have side effects, and there is a, huge, a high level of toxicity with Americans today. In addition to excess pharmaceuticals, we have a corrupted food supply, we have uh, you know, people grabbing food on the run, uh, going through a drive through etc. So stress and subluxations essentially are a major cause of disease that receives no attention. For all the people you see walking down the street, most of them are not receiving the wellness care they need. 
So stress causes muscle spasm. What are some answers to stress? I'll give you two. Number one would be uh, prayer. My dad's a pastor, so it's legal I can pray. So meditation and or prayer, which, uh, you know, um, sitting still, thinking or on things that matter, and sitting still, shutting off the TV, phones, and uh, computers for just a little bit, 15 minutes a day. Um, so you say, Doc, I don't have time for 15 minutes of contemplating the universe, so it gets worse. And you get what? Muscle spasms. Muscle spasms. And so pretty soon the body's tight, it's tense, muscles are in spasm, and who's best equipped to work, uh, to work those muscle spasms out of the body? I'll give you a hint, it's not me. Who's best equipped to do that? It's yourself. The massage therapist, actually. Massage therapists, they, they are trained to work those knots and uh, muscle spasms out of the back. And the massage therapist tells you you need to come in uh, once a week for six weeks. And you say, Doc, I don't have $70 a week for six weeks in a row to remove muscle spasms. So it gets worse. And you start to develop what? Yes, because of bone, muscles pull the bones out of place. And they tell you you need to come in every seven to ten days for a massage, massage therapy. But your chiropractor yells and waves his arms too much. So you skip going to the chiropractor, friendly neighborhood chiropractor, and you get dysfunction. So let's say you have tight muscles, tight hamstrings, uh, things are not conditioned like they should be, you sit too much on the job, and who's best equipped to give you a series of exercises to help re rehabilitate uh, dysfunction? Actually, physical therapists. Because chiropractors do what? We locate and correct subluxations. subluxations, exactly. So you go to the physical therapist and they treat the dysfunction and you say, but doc, I don't have $75 per session three times a week for four weeks or longer. And so it gets worse. And let's say you get to the point where you have... Um, pain going down one leg and back pain. And they send you to a fancy neurologist in Columbus or Cleveland Clinic with a lot of letters behind his name. And he tells you you have a disc herniation of L5 with impingement on the right nerve root causing sciatica radiating to the distal extremity all the way, say, to the foot. And so you got this fancy diagnosis and you feel better, right? Now you're back to stress. No, you feel more stress. You start all over again. You start all over again. So chiropractors interrupt the cycle here and here. We lower stress levels. Actually, they can detect lower cortisol levels in the saliva. And we lower the muscle spasms because what controls the muscles? The nerves. Nerves, right. And we release that pressure on the nerves. And we halt any progression of dysfunction. Why every seven to 10 days? Why do chiropractors adjust their families? And why do chiropractors recommend and get adjusted themselves every seven to 10 days? Well, let's look at that. Why once a week? This is a 1987 study by Dr. Wiedemann. Dr. Wiedemann. They've had other studies since, but uh, this is, goes clear back to 1987. We've understood this for a very long time. And it found that after just seven to 14 days, of immobilization, what they did was they took rabbits and immobilized with a cast their knee joint. We can see arthritis forming in the joint. So they actually looked into the joint at two days, fine. Three days, it's okay. But soon, it starts to form arthritis. So they found formed increased formation of collagen seen after just even three days, that's scar tissue. So it starts with scar tissue, then you wear down the cartilage as it talks about, using fancy words, and then you start even wearing down bone. So this arthritis can also form after repeated short periods of loss of motion in a joint lasting several days. So once the wearing of the bone has taken place, these changes are not considered to be reversible. Also one joint, they have found, like Dr. Wolf and others have found that 
the body does remodel a little bit according to imposed demand. So that can be reversed just a little bit. So not entirely uh, up to date here. But also one joint that loses motion affects the joints around it. So it starts to become a domino effect above and below. So why once a week? Number one far and above the second one, but number one far and above is to release blocked nerve impulses. To make sure we eliminate interference between the brain and the body. Because that is most critical. That's your lifeline. You can survive for weeks without food. Days without water. Minutes without oxygen. But you can't even survive split seconds without nerve supply. Number two is to avoid arthritis and degeneration. And that's why we recommend once a week. So five things you can do to keep yourself and your family healthy. Number one, eat well. If it has things that you can't pronounce in the ingredient list, what do you do? Throw it out. Don't eat it. Move well. So that daily exercise, some kind of movement is very, very critical. And it can't be what you get on the job place. I adjust many people going room to room to room every day, but I still get up at 5 a.m. and work out. So move well. Number three, think well. Meditate prayer, keep a gratitude journal. If you have stinking thinking, raise your hand. you know anybody that has stinking thinking? Yes, most people do. If you have stinking thinking long enough, what do you develop? A, medica a, a condition medical condition known as hardening of the attitudes. And you don't want that. So think well. Avoid stinking thinking. Number four, stay well adjusted. Get your family's spine checked once a week. Number five, sleep well. All those are very critical. So who should be checked? Everyone. What do you have to have to have a subluxation? There's two ingredients. Number one would be, what's this back here? A spine. Yeah. The spine. Number two, you need to have what causes a subluxation. I mean, there's three flavors of it, but just what's the overall cause? Stress. stress. A spine and stress. Is there anybody you know that does not have sp a spine or stress? Absolutely. That's why I checked all three of my kids. This was them a few years ago, within hours of their births, and I continue to check them on a weekly basis. I want to give them the best possible start on life. The best possible start I can give them. And our mission is to make our community happier, healthier, and putting more life in the years we have. That really is our practice model. And that's why we're doing everything that we do. Everything from giving insurance the boot to the road to, uh, to making chiropractic available on a wellness level. We do this by providing quality spinal care with a professional, timely manner. When you're coming on a regular basis, you'll know that you, you notice that you get in and get out. In a family-friendly atmosphere, so that people can bring their families, and that's why we treat kids for free. How to help us fulfill our mission. RYF. What does RYF stand for? Run, you fool! No, yes, <laughs> refer your friends and family. Once I give you the information, I put a little bit of re responsibility and weight is taken off of me, and who is it placed on? You guys. Now you have some information that a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't understand wellness chiropractic because it's been dominated by an injury treatment, auto accident, insurance industry. So that brings up the story of Brandon. And to understand a little bit about uh, Brandon, which was my brother, that's a little bit why I got into chiropractic. See, Brandon and I were in martial arts together. And we went up through the ranks together. And Brandon had a condition that you probably know someone that has, asthma. Have, you ever, have any of you ever seen someone have an asthma attack? It is not pretty. So that was hard on Brandon, and it was even hard on older brother seeing a younger brother basically suffocating, you know, and that, that can kill people uh, in the United States. So we're going up through the ranks, and Brandon has our instructor told Brandon, he was an ex-Marine, great guy, 
I'm in Batesville, Arkansas, no longer, no longer alive, died in a tragic accident, but fantastic guy that we uh, I think highly of to this day, made a big impact on us. Nevertheless, he told Brandon something kind of harsh. Brandon, if you don't get control of your asthma, I'm going to pull your black belt. That was a rough thing for a kid to hear. See, he thought you could move heaven and earth with your mind. And I do believe that there is a sphere of limits to our mind. Our mind has a powerful influence. That's partly what chiropractors are betting on, is the influence of your mind on your body through the highway of the nerves. But nevertheless, Brandon couldn't just think happy thoughts and get out of it. So, to understand what my parents did next, why my, what my dad did with Brandon, you have to go back a generation. See, my dad saw his dad die on the living room couch of, of rheumatoid arthritis. And you say, well, rheumatoid arthritis can't kill people. Right. It was the medication that killed his dad. See, they used to treat indiscriminately with steroid medications. And to this day, the autoimmune medications are among the most deadly, even to this day. So fast forward a few years, and it was a corticosteroid that they used at that time. Fast forward a few years, Brandon has asthma, and the primary treatment of asthma is what? It's steroids. Yes, steroids in an inhaler. So do you think there's any way in God's green earth that dad is going to put Brandon on an inhaler? Long term is a long term solution. So what's the, and, and keep in mind, dad is a medically trained uh, dental surgeon. So we did the, what we knew, and uh, dad took Brandon to Dr. Tom Taylor of White River Chiropractic in Batesville, Arkansas. One of twins, and his boys now are in chiropractic. So he made a big impact on us, obviously. But we took Brandon in, and he's looking at Brandon's spine, and we, he's evaluating, does the palpation, does the range of motion, looks at the muscle tension, looks at the alignment, and does a full evaluation. And uh, we look at Dr. Taylor and say, Doc, can you cure Brandon's asthma? What did he say? No. He said, no. He said he was kind of crusty. How the blankety blank do I know? <laughs> <laughs> kind of rough to hear, but... He said this, he said, this bone is out of place. And it sends nerves through the cardiopulmonary nerve. And what does that go to? The, heart. the lungs and heart, yes. And he said, that bone is out of place. Is it better, in, is it better off in place or out of place? What did you, we say? In place. Same thing you said when you came in. And he said, shall we get started? What did we say? Okay. Of course. <laughs> so he adjusted Brandon. And Brandon, over some time, became less and less reliant on his inhaler. To this day, he has no asthma. Zero. He's lived in high elevation Colorado. He's a wildlife uh, artist, is a children's book illustrator, is a graphic designer working with a uh, Sony record label and, and Disney. And now he lives in Oregon. And he's, of course, a pastor with four kids. Big strapping guy. So... You all have an opportunity to be a Brandon story. You never know what today's intervention today might be preventing tomorrow. And how do we make the weekly checkups affordable for everyone? I do have a phase two that uh, I want to begin in maybe in two years. But right now, this is what we can do. Insurance is for sick care, not for health care. Do insurance companies care about your health? No, they do not. So I want you to get the care I give to my own family. So what am I doing? Well, number one, if an organization chained off oxygen and you had all this oxygen, you knew everybody needed oxygen, and an organization had you chain the oxygen off from them, what would you do with that organization? Break that chain. You would kick them to the curb. And that's exactly what we've done. So that allows us to give the care that I give to my family and that I get to all my patients, and that's why we make available the wellness membership.
So how you begin your health journey. Number one, only attendees of this class are eligible to join the wellness club. Okay? Because we've given you information that cuts down a little bit on the confusion of why you're coming to me. Um, it's automatic monthly credit card charge is 76 a month for up to four visits. I encourage you to make sure you're in every seven to ten days. And the spouse can join for only 30 a month. All kids 17 and under are free. So effectively, a spouse and a, an individual and their spouse, that cuts it down to 1325 a visit, something like that. And you pay nothing at the front desk when you come in for a visit. No appointment is needed. So a lot of people do elect to make an appointment. That way it's a standing appointment that they can be reminded of and make sure they take advantage of their visits. But it's automatically canceled if you do not come in at least two times in any given month. So we automatically go back, check, and we cancel people's membership if they're not coming in regularly. With, without giving us notice. So we put a sticky note on there if you're going to be gone, and then that way uh, we do not cancel your membership if, say, you're on vacation. You can cancel at any time, by the way. Not that we recommend it. So automatically cancel. Why do we cancel it if you don't show up at least twice in a month? Number one, no point in having the service if you're not taking advantage of it. But from my perspective, as far as where I'm coming from, I take it very seriously. I take my family's health very seriously. I take my ch spinal checks very seriously. And I want the best for all my patients. Remember, I see you as a masterpiece. And I want to give you the best possible chance at health. And if you're not taking advantage of it, we don't want you part of the membership. Although you can still utilize our services, obviously. So that's our premier uh, offering right now. But this all comes back to who? You. So number one, like I said, you have the opportunity to be a Brandon-like story. You have the opportunity right now to intervene and stop something that may be developing into something far more serious down the road. Keep in mind, we understand the cumulative harmful effects of pinched nerves over the years. Number two, the responsibility and weight is now off my shoulders and on whose shoulders? Yours. Now you have some information that you need to share with everybody else around you. So I encourage you definitely to share the information with your friends and family member. Bring in kids. Let them know. Give them the same information I've given you. Send them to this class. And then we give them the information and they make up their, their minds on what they want to do with it. Thank you everybody for attending.